Welcome back to Japanese religion. In this video, we're going to look at the evolution of Buddhism and Shinto during the Kamakura and Muromachi periods. The Kamakura period lasted from 1185 to 1333. It started when the samurai lord Minamoto Yoritomo defeated the rival samurai clan Taira and the noble clan Fujiwara and became the first shogun or military ruler of Japan. Now, previous to this, the samurai clan Taira had dominated the government, but they did not have the title of shogun. So Kamakura became the center of power or the capital of the new shogun. That's why the period is named after it. However, the emperor continued to live in the imperial capital of Kyoto, where he does to this day. One of the ideas you see spread through the Kamakura period is that of the Mapo or end times. Buddhist cosmology is cyclic. The universe is created by Brahma, a creator God, who's not all powerful or all knowing. He's a being in samsara, just like us, but more powerful. But after the creation of the universe, it lasts for a long time eventually it will be destroyed and recreated by another Brahma. It's just a cycle that keeps repeating without real purpose or goal forever. So there's also a theory of stages of the progress within one of those world systems over time. So the Ma Po is the concept that our current age is coming to an end before the Dharma will be restored by another Buddha. Connected to the doctrine of the cosmic cycle, the creation, preservation, destruction, and recreation of the cosmos, there is a notion that the Dharma itself, or the teaching of a Buddha, does not last forever. In a sense, the Dharma is always there, but the idea is that it declines over time, after it's been initially taught by a Buddha, as people forget it, misinterpret it, etc. And also, as the Dharma declines, the world generally becomes more chaotic, violent, sinful before the Dharma is restored by another Buddha. Well, in Japan, the um, end times were, be, were predicted to begin in 1052. And this was later used to interpret the chaotic end to the Heian period, the previous period before Kamakura, in which you had a lot of fighting between the Taira and Minamoto clans. During the Kamakura period, there were new Buddhist sects founded that became the most important in Japanese Buddhism, Pure Land, Nichiren, and Zen. Also, it's during the Kamakura period that Buddhism spread uh, among the common people, not just among the nobles and elites in the capitals. Following the Kamakura period was the Muromachi period. This period was established by Ashikaga Takauji, who established the Murimacha Shogunate or military government in 1338 after a brief restoration of imperial rule. So the style of the rule by shogun or samurai lords persisted. It was just a different clan took over. Let's talk a bit more about the Bakufu or the military government founded by the shogun. So this basically means a form of government in which the shogun is the military ruler who rules in the name of the emperor, but has all the actual political power. As we've discussed, the emperors were still regarded as sacred beings, sacred persons. So it would have been a violation of the kami, among other things, to harm or kill the emperor. So they're still ruling in the capital. The capital Kyoto is still very important for the culture and religion of Japan throughout these periods. So new sects of Buddhism tend to be founded in the capital. You have to have your temple in Kyoto. But the actual political power is held by the shogun and other clans of samurai. The samurai clans are headed by daimyo, noble lords who own and govern their own lands or estates. So it's a feudal system of government. The noble clans that surrounded the imperial court still actually exist in Kyoto during this period. However, much of the actual power is held by the shogun and the daimyo. 
Um, and then the term samurai just refers to a warrior who fights in the service of a daimyo. And they could be considered, um, the samurai class was quite expansive. It included both the most powerful and wealthy daimyo, but also the lesser warriors who served them. There were um, commoners who were not from the samurai class, who were basically like peasants or craftsmen who could also fight. And those were distinct from the samurai. So there was a class aspect of being a samurai. It was being in a kind of privileged position because of your connection to this new ruling class. So if you were from a samurai family, it was like being from a noble family. So during this time, Bushido or the way of the warrior was developed. This is essentially a code of honor that samurai were supposed to follow based in part upon the earlier stories of the epic battles between the Minamoto and the Taira clans. But the ethic continued into this period. One example of Bushido is seppuku, which is the practice of suicide for a dishonored samurai. Um, basically, this could be done in various circumstances, but one of them classically was if you failed to defend or protect your lord, your daimyo, you had dishonored yourself and therefore you would commit suicide as an act of trying to repair this unrepairable error or misdeed to your Lord. It also illustrates though the ethic of self-sacrifice, which was a big part of Bushido. The samurai were not supposed to have ego. They were supposed to sublimate their ego in service of their Lord. Now this is not directly connected to the religions of Shinto and Buddhism. However, this ethic of discipline self-sacrifice did uh, shade or color some of the later developments of Shinto and Buddhism. So even though it was not originally religious in origin, there was some kind of mixing in between them. You can see this, for example, after the um, end of the military system of government in the late 19th century Japan, after Meiji restoration, there's a couple of things that happened. One, Shinto is made into a kind of national religion, but it is connected to this idea of self-sacrifice and service to the emperor. You could definitely make the case that that attitude of Shinto of that time, the late 1800s, early 1900s, as every citizen in Japan should have a relationship to the kami of the emperor as if they were samurai being dedicated to their lord. I mean, you could say that taken too far, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but there's definitely a connection there. The way Shinto and Buddhism became kind of um, culturally shaped in part by Bushido and also somewhat politicized. So during these periods of Kamakura, there were some very important de developments in Buddhism. The Pure Land or Jodo Shu sect was developed um, in part by the work of Genshin. Genshin was actually a Tendai monk. This was somewhat common for monks ordained in one sect to then study and become interested in another approach to Buddhism, to not leave their initial sect, but to advocate this new approach as well, possibly alongside their original practice. So Tendai monk uh, Genshin ends up becoming interested in Pure Land or Jodo Shu Buddhism. So he's one of the first to argue that the Nambutsu or that mantra Namu Amidu Butsu, calling upon the name of Amida Buddha, honoring the name of Amida Buddha, he argued this is a very important part of Buddhism. And so, you know, all Buddhists should practice it, basically. The idea of the mantra is that in the Mapo, salvation can only be attained through honoring Amida Buddha. Amida Buddha will allow you to be reborn in the Pure Land. Amida is the Japanese name for Amitabha Buddha. Um, so this is to emphasize what's called Tariki in Japanese, other power. We're relying upon the power of the Buddha Amida. We cannot rely upon our own power, Jiriki, because it's regarded as too sinful of a time, too far away from the teaching of the Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha or Siddhartha Gautama. We're in the end times, so we have to rely upon Amida Buddha. Genshin wrote a text called Essentials of Birth in the Pure Land, where he basically described not only the blessings of the paradise of the pure land, from which you'll recall, it was an easier place to attain nirvana. 
technically the pure land is not the main goal of pure land buddhism the main goal is still nirvana as with buddhism in general but from the pure land you'll be in the presence of amida buddha and then from that presence you'll get the teaching directly you'll understand the dharma you'll be able to attain nirvana therefrom in a very pleasant setting as well so in addition to describing the state of blessedness of the pure land he also describes in graphic detail the torments you'll suffer in the hells or other realms of rebirth if you fail to reach the pure land so this text became very influential it made the idea of the goal being rebirth in the pure land and avoiding the other realms of rebirth very prominent in japanese buddhism generally and the practice of nembutsu is still very common among japanese buddhists to this day so another important figure in the early history of Pure Land or Jodo Shu was Honen. So he argued a more radical teaching that because of the expansive, all-encompassing grace of Amida Buddha, lay people had equal access to Amida's grace as monks. So most Buddhists, I mean, even to this day in Japan, would regard monks as having a kind of special status in the religion. But this idea is that, look, the Nembutsu can be chanted alike by monks and lay people. And Amida would be less compassionate if he weren't extending the same grace to lay people. So this basically was um, getting rid of some of that hierarchy between monks and lay people. This added to the appeal of Pure Land Buddhism among the commoners, among the masses in Japan. Because of the radical nature of this teaching, Honen was banished from the capital of Kyoto for four years, basically by rival monks who didn't like this teaching. There was also a lot of bad blood in general between Tendai monks and Pure Land. So Tendai had basically become the prominent sect of Buddhism. It had the most support and patronage among the noble families, among the emperor, among the samurai clans even. And um, the Tendai monks were very jealous of this new upstart sect. In fact, after the death of Honen, they desecrated his grave and burned copies of his works. Shows you how intense the rivalry was and violent. So there's another type of Pure Land Buddhism called True Pure Land or Jodo Shinshu. This was founded by Shinran. He was actually a disciple or follower of Honen. Shinran took the idea of a lack of dichotomy between monks and lay people one step further. He married even though he was a monk, which is violating the vows of celibacy that Buddhist monks are traditionally supposed to abide by. His reasoning, again, was in part that Ami, Amida's grace is not going to stop with celibacy. You still have access to Amida's grace, even if you're married, as long as you recite the Nembutsu. He was banished from Kyoto for seven years, so controversial were his teachings. He also taught that a single recitation of the Nembutsu could give you salvation. Now, customarily in Pure Land Buddhism, you have to recite the mantra thousands of times for it to have its uh, effect. However, the idea of Shinran is that as long as you recite it with perfect sincerity of heart once, then Amida will basically let you be reborn in the Pure Land. True Pure Land spread to the countryside even more widely than Pure Land had, and it was practiced by small groups of lay people who recited the Nambutsu together. So it could be practiced um, without a lot of intervention of monks, even though there were uh, clergy in the sect as well. And even if it was being um, suppressed by the authorities, it could still spread because of the very simple practice. So another important figure in true Pure Land was Renio, and he was the one who organized these previously scattered followers of true Pure Land who were practicing in different villages in the countryside. And he created an armed security force, a militia, if you will, to protect Honganji Temple from attacks by its enemies, especially Tendai. And this was the beginning of an odd custom in Japanese history there were actually some Buddhist temples that had their own militias, despite the fact that Buddhist monks are supposed to be nonviolent. That's one of the precepts. Now, initially it started for self-defense purposes because of these violent attacks from their rivals. And also sometimes they were attacked by samurai who might've been 
allied with Tendai or just didn't like them, were worried about their power or influence. And these militias included both lay people or peasants fighting and also warrior monks, sometimes called Yamabushi or mountain warriors. But it was basically a way of referring to Buddhist monks who would actually fight in defense of their temple. And some of these militias became quite powerful and some of the temples gained control actually of some of the provinces of Japan. And they were kind of like a thorn in the side of some of the shogun and other samurai class. So also during this period, we see the introduction of Zen Buddhism into Japan from China. Zen is the Japanese name for Chan Buddhism or the meditation school. Rinzai is the Japanese name for the Linji school of Chan Buddhism. Rinzai Zen or Linji Chan was brought to Japan by Eizai. He was a Tendai monk who traveled to China originally because he wanted to learn more deeply about Tendai and Shingon Buddhism. However, while in China, he came into contact with Lin Chi Chan and he was very impressed. So he brought back knowledge of this distinctively Chinese approach to Buddhism to Japan. He also brought back the custom of drinking tea or cha to Japan from China. So it was adopted initially by Buddhist monks in part to help them stay focused in meditation, but it was soon adopted and popularized by the nobles and samurai. So these are some of the Japanese names for terms from Chan Buddhism that we explored previously in our Chinese religion videos. Zazen refers to seated meditation or Duo Chan in Chinese. Shikantaza refers to the just sitting meditation or Qi Guan Da Tuo. The just sitting is where you don't focus on the breath or another theme of meditation. And you just basically focus on your awareness itself. You're confronting your own mind directly. This is regarded as the most intense form of meditation in Zen, but also potentially the most profitable. Koan is the Japanese word for gong on. These are the short stories or puzzles that you're supposed to meditate upon that have no rational solution, but you can sort of pierce through in a moment of intuition. And Satori is the Japanese word for awakening or enlightenment. Rinzai Zen had the fortune of attracting the support of the samurai class in Kamakura. Kamakura was the capital of the shogun. And in part, it seems that the samurai were supporting this new sect of Buddhism to make a distinction between themselves and the nobles and the emperor who had previously mainly supported Tendai. But this was a new political power, so they were kind of supporting a new sect. Also, there were probably some aspects of Rinzai Zen, the intense discipline of meditation, for example, that were attractive to the samurai. Zen temples were also built in the imperial capital in Kyoto because Kyoto remained the religious center of Japan. Kenin-ji was the first Zen temple built by Eisai. You can see a picture from it here. There were also temples and the five sacred mountains, the five mountains. These were the main temples of Rinzai Zen. The shogunate or the bakufu, the samurai government, made these temples into administrative outposts. Partly what was going on was that the um, shogun mainly ruled in a kind of feudal system. So he depended upon the allegiance of the daimyo or lords who were under him. And there were oftentimes daimyo who would conspire against the shogun, leading to fights or civil wars. So one way of maintaining control was by having these temples as administrative outposts where they could get information and make contacts in other parts of the kingdom or the empire. So Zen also became associated with the fine arts during this time, poetry, calligraphy, landscape gardening, and others. So there were a couple of reasons for this. One was the fact that they were being patronized by the ruling class, the samurai, who had also taken an interest in these fine arts as a mark of their noble status. Another thing was that when Zen was brought back from China, a lot of the customs of the Chinese Buddhist monasteries also made their way back to Japan. The monasteries of China were influenced by the Chinese cultural tradition of the scholarly class or Ru. 
So because the people in the monasteries who were studying the sutras were essentially scholars, they also became literate in Chinese and familiar with the classics of Chinese culture. So perhaps somewhat paradoxically, you had a lot of classical Chinese literature, including the Confucian classics, studied and taught in these Zen temples. And also, Zen became associated with the martial arts. In other words, things like sword play, archery, things um, um, the unarmed fighting arts like judo or jujitsu. These were practiced by the samurai, and some of these same samurai were practicing Zen meditation. And there was kind of a general sense that in order to perfect yourself in a martial art, you had to train your mind as well as your body. And meditation was a way of training your mind. But it also went in the other direction. So by practicing a martial art, you had to practice great discipline and focus. And this could also be translated to the meditation practice. Soto Zen is the Japanese name for Tsao Dong Chan, another school of Chan Buddhism. This was brought to Japan by the monk Dogen. He was also originally a Tendai monk at Mount Hiei. He traveled to Song Dynasty China to learn more about Buddhism. He ended up encountering Soto Zen there and brought it back to Japan. So this is similar to Rinzai Zen. However, um, the, one of the characteristic beliefs of Soto Zen is that you can practice meditation in your daily activities. So Dogen had an encounter with the head cook of a temple in China who was a senior monk. And in the Japanese temples, the cooks would be regarded as people of inferior status. If you were a monk working as a cook, you were basically paying your dues before you could um, just become a senior monk and not have to do the kind of menial work. So Dogen asked this monk, why are you a senior monk in this position? And the monk explained to him that he can do his meditation practice while he's preparing food, while he's chopping, while he's cutting, while he's straining rice, etc. And this idea was somewhat influenced by the sixth patriarch of Chan Buddhism in China, Hui Neng. So this was a revelation for Dogen because it meant you could incorporate meditation practice and even the state of enlightenment into your daily life. He brought these teachings back to Japan. He founded a temple, Aheji, which is still the um, head temple of Soto Zen Buddhism today. Soto Zen began to spread among the peasants and among the samurai of the countryside. So outside of the samurai capital of Kamakura. Um, it's regarded as a kind of more rustic form of Zen that's more approachable for people who aren't in the elites. It also became somewhat popular among the commoners because of a somewhat interesting practice that started in the 15th century in which lay people who were followers of the sect were symbolically ordained as monks after their death by having their hair cut. This was regarded as a way of basically elevating their status in their religion and making it more likely they could attain nirvana or rebirth in a superior position in their next life because of the good merit of being a monk. Um, and this practice is still continued today by Soto Zen Buddhists. Nichiren Buddhism was another sect of Buddhism entirely founded by the somewhat cantankerous controversial monk Nichiren. So he taught that the Lotus Sutra is the only path to salvation in the Mapo. And he taught that everyone, monks and lay people, can um, attain this salvation by chanting the mantra Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. This is how the Lotus Sutra is honored traditionally. So this was a new mantra, and he was very critical in the other approaches to Buddhism. He says, the Nembutsu is hell. Zen is a devil, and Shingon is the nation's ruin. So he's basically trash-talking the other Japanese sects. He also blamed all of Japan's problems on the fact that its rulers did not follow the Lotus Sutra. So he's basically outdoing the Tendai here and doubling down on this kind of Lotus Sutra fundamentalism, you might say, but also this new mantra practice. So people didn't take him that seriously until the Mongols invaded Japan from Korea in 1274. 
The Japanese were able to fight off this invasion in part because of the great skill of the samurai class, but this was regarded as a confirmation of Nichiren's prophecies that the nation was going to fall into ruin unless they adopted the practices he recommended. So the sect did survive and thrive. Um, the temple founded by Nichiren is at Mount Minobu. And you'll notice a lot of the key temples in Japanese Buddhism are on these mountains, many of which were previously regarded as sacred places before the temples were built there. So let's talk about Shinto during this period. So after the emperors lost their actual power, as the samurai class became predominant and the emperor family and the nobles became somewhat sidelined, the emperors were no longer able to give financial support to the important Shinto shrines. The Issei Grand Shrines were the most important for the emperor. They were dedicated to Amaterasu. They lost imperial funding after the initial Minamoto victory in 1185. So they had to devise different ways to sustain themselves financially. They opened themselves to visits, not only to the imperial family, but also to the samurai and other officials in the government. They performed purification rituals in exchange for offerings. And they also allowed Buddhist temples to, to be built there alongside the shrines to attract Buddhist followers as well. So um, another way that the Shinto people accommodated themselves, not only to the loss of the imperial funding, but to the rise of Buddhism, was through acknowledging the legitimacy of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. But unlike the Buddhists, they did not regard the kami as mere traces or manifestations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They regarded the kami as the fundamental beings in their own right, and if anything, tended to reverse it, saying the Buddhas were just manifestations of the kami but they did regard them as authentic spiritual beings you could worship alongside the kami. Another important event for the history of Shinto was in 1542, this was somewhat later, but the Yoshida clan was granted authority to appoint and demote Shinto priests. And this proved the beginnings of what you could say is the more organized form of Shinto, where there's kind of like a central authority saying who's qualified to be a priest, who isn't. Um, before this time, and still somewhat to this day, um, although there are now official Shinto universities that will authenticate you, but it was kind of like a customary thing where each shrine had its own customs for who the next priest would be, often just inherited in families. Sometimes there were other methods as well. The picture on the right, incidentally, shows a picture of a torii, or gate. This is a traditional way of marking the boundary of a shrine's sacred space. And some shrines have multiple tories, as you can see in this case. There's another one at the end of the stairs there. So also during this period, Confucianism became an important ideology among the samurai ruling class and other scholars um, in Japan. So ironically, it was the Neo-Confucianism of Chinese scholars such as Chu Shi was brought back by Zen monks. It was part of the cultural package that the Chan Buddhism was associated with in China. And Confucianism, specifically the Neo-Confucian teachings of people like Chu Shi, were taught in the Five Mountains monasteries alongside Zen. Um, and this basically increased the interest in Confucianism during the turmoil, the chaos of both the Kamakura and the Muromachi periods. There was a lot of fighting off and on between the samurai clans. So an example of this influence is Fujiwara Seika. He was originally a Zen monk who later rejected Buddhism entirely and advocated Neo-Confucianism. So um, some of the criticisms of Buddhism, Buddhism remained quite popular. Most people who were fans of Neo-Confucianism combined it with Buddhism, but there were these Neo-Confucian attacks on Buddhism that look this lifestyle takes you out of the world, the lifestyle of a monk. It's sort of an otherworldly ideology. It's more important to focus on social order, political stability, and Neo-Confucianism is the doctrine for that. Much later, Neo-Confucianism became the state ideology of the Tokugawa shogunate. 